Thank you, and good morning to all of you. Um, I feel like I say this often when I'm here, but uh, I had the, I've had the privilege of filling in for Pastor Dave a few times uh, over the, the years, and each time I come back, there's a lot of new faces. And uh, the, the first service, there were a lot of folks here that I knew uh, for a long time, and, but as I come and I see new faces at the service, that's, that's a good thing. That means more people are coming and uh, God has been blessing Pastor Dave and Sandy and, and their ministry uh, to all of you. And so I'm thankful for that. As I come and fill in for Pastor Dave, uh, I guess I have to say that along with that comes a lot of responsibility. And one of the things that I really felt responsible for this week was um, to maybe to let some of you know what happens with some of the staff here at the church. Because these kind of things probably don't get passed on very often. But um, I, I was sharing with the, the folks at the first service that Jeremy went to the hospital one day to visit. And so uh, he decided to take his, his guitar along with him. He thought maybe he could cheer somebody up with playing some music or whatever. And so you know what it's like at the hospital. You, when you get off the elevator, there's those really big windows, and there were some patients sitting there. And so he played the guitar for them, played a few songs. And, and when he was done, he said he was going to leave. And he said, I hope you get better. One of the guys looked up and said, we hope you get better too. Some of you took a little while on that one, but <laughs> then there was another time when Pastor Dave and Sandy were going to a conference, and, and they decided to go for breakfast on the way, and so they stopped at a restaurant and ate, and, and then they realized they were a little bit behind time, and so uh, they started down the road after they left the restaurant, and Sandy says, you're not going to believe this. I forgot my glasses at the restaurant. Well... You know, Pastor Dave and Sandy, when they're up here, they're always like real mushy and everything, you know. But the reality is Pastor Dave got quiet. It, the car was silent. He gets to the next exit, turns around, and he comes back to the restaurant. They get pulled in the parking lot, and Sandy goes to get out of the car. And just as she's getting out of the, out of the door, Dave finally speaks. And he says, you know what? While you're in there, grab my hat, too. Oh, my. Well, anyhow, down to serious business. I did want to share some things with you today. And I, I think about life in general and, and things that we do. Um, you, you've heard the phrase of someone who maybe has it all. You, you see the movie stars that have all these things or someone that's well off or, or someone just seems to have their life together. And we often use the phrase, they are living the life. You may have heard that before. But as I thought about Christians, about us, what is living the life? What is it really all about? And, and uh, Peter, in, in his uh, two letters that he's written for us in the Scriptures, the first one, he refers to some things about life and how we should live. And so if you have your Bible with you, I'll encourage you to turn to 1 Peter chapter 4. I will say, say that I, I didn't see the church bulletin until I got here this morning. And so you can follow along. There's an outline in the bulletin. I noticed this morning that there were some fill in the blanks. Uh, I'm just going to say this ahead of time. That wasn't me. That was Sandy. So um, she had the outline. She put the blanks in. So you're going to have to pay attention. But First Peter chapter 4, if I could begin with verse 1. I'd like to read through the passage and then go back over it uh, and, and divide it up a little bit more. Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude, because he who has suffered in his body is done with sin. As a result, he does not live like live the rest of his earthly life for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans chose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. 
They think it strange that you do not plunge with them into the same flood of dissipation and they heap abuse on you. But they will have to give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is the reason the gospel was preached, even to those who are now dead, so that they, may be, they might be judged according to men in regard to the body, but live according to God in regard to the spirit. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, he should do, do it as one speaking the very words of God. If anyone serves, he should do it with the strength that God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Would you bow your heads with me as we ask God's spirit to be upon us for the next few moments? Father, thank you. Thank you for giving us this time to spend together. I thank you for your word. As I think of the many writers of the scriptures and how you each, in, in your own way for them, allow them to write your words for us. Thank you for uh, the opportunity not only to read these words, but to understand them. I ask today for your Holy Spirit to help us to apply what is given to us, that we might not just hear them today and go on and live life the way we did in the past, but that we might take these words and heed them to them and, and, and live for you in the days ahead. So I ask these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. First thing I'd like to talk about this morning is it's about Jesus being our example. At the beginning of this chapter, Peter says, Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude. And so since Christ suffered, what a great time to talk about all of this right before Easter. And as you think about what Jesus has done for us, the suffering of his body. He came here on this earth. And as I think of all the things that happened to him, we can, as human beings, we can relate to the, to, to the physical pain that he endured. The bruising, he was punched, he was spit upon, his body was pierced to the point that it bled, that the blood ran from his body. And it was all for us. But he suffered for us. In chapter 2 of this same letter, Peter said, To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving an example that you should follow in his steps. He left an example for us to do what he has called us to do, to live how he has lived. Uh, I think of the, the book that was written a while back called In His Steps was also given the name that we often have the initials on bracelets and everything else. Anybody know what it was? What would Jesus do? In any situation, what would Jesus do? We have his life in the Gospels as it was written for us that we can look at it and see what did Jesus do in this setting, in this setting? What did he do here and there? How did he live? We have a way that we can follow him as an example. And then in verse 23, right after that, it says, They hurled their insults at him. He did not retaliate when he suffered. He made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. When I think about Jesus not retaliating, what, what is our, often what is our first response when somebody does something to us? We want to fight back, right? We want to do something to get back at them. We want things to be done so that they can pay for hurting me. When I think of Jesus going through the trials 
as he did that last 24 hours. We're, we're doing a, a sermon series at the church that I'm at, uh, the, the uh, 24 hours. The 24 hours it affected the world. So when I, I think when, when, uh, when Jesus went through this last 24 hours, took the beatings, he suffered all for you and for me. What a, a great God we have who loved us that much. But anyhow, it says he didn't retaliate. He, he made no threats through all of that. And so not only did he just tell us what to do, he lived it. He lived it. He showed us that it could be done. Well, he also tells us in that same verse that we are to arm ourselves with the same attitude. And it all, a lot of it does begin with attitude. How, how do we feel or what comes from the inside? What kind of attitude? I guess as I say that word, we often talk about that, don't we? Somebody doesn't have a very good attitude. That's when we use the word, right? Yeah, they really got an attitude. We need to have the same attitude as Christ. In Philippians chapter 2, I'm not going to spend time and go back and look at that whole chapter but, uh, but if you look at Philippians 2, Jesus came and it tells us that he made himself nothing. He didn't consider equality with God something to hold on to. Th this is the one part of what Christ has done for us that I don't know that I can ever truly understand. Jesus had it all in heaven. He had it all. And he gave that up to come here. He could have stayed. He could have loved us from where he was. But rather than staying where he was, he gave up being equal to God the Father for a while. It says he gave that up. Gave, he didn't hold on to that. It, he didn't think it was something to hold on to or to grasp. And so he came here, gave that all up, and came as a man upon this earth. When I think of our attitudes, we think we own a lot of things. We think we have the right to do a lot of things. Jesus had the right to stay in heaven, and he didn't. And so we as Christians often have to give up our rights, to give up what we think we deserve or what we think is the right thing to do. Jesus gave all of that up for us. That passage in Philippians 2 said it was even obedient to death. When I think of Jesus being obedient to death and the attitude that he had, I want you to think about him in that whole scene of him being at the Last Supper. He takes the disciples and, and they go to uh, the, the Garden of Gethsemane and Jesus prays. And what does he say in the garden? How does he pray? Lord, if there's any other way that we can do this, or Father, is there any other way that we can do this? And there wasn't. There was no other way. And it's, <coughs> excuse me, his final words. Not my will, but yours. And so when I think of Jesus and him going through all of this, the attitude that he had was not that I wanted everything to be done my way. He knew that it was going to hurt. He knew the pain that was coming. And yet he said, I am willing to go through with this because there was no other way. And he said, Father, I want your will to be done. And so as I think of living the life, that is the one thing that I want you to think about in your own life. I don't know what all of you are going through. Some of you may be going through some trials right now. You may be going through some good times. And in all of that, can you look at what you're facing right now and say, Lord, I want your will to be done through all of this. I want your will to be done. If all of this is happening so that I can grow or that someone else can be blessed, or something, this or that can happen. That's what I want. So many times, we want what we want. We want it the easy way. If we're going through troubled times, what do we want? I want out of this. 
But I want you to know, too, that Jesus struggled with this as well. When you ask those questions, Lord, is, it, is there any other way? You know, can, can I get out of this? In his earthly form, Jesus asked the same question. Is there any other way? Can, we, can I get out of this? I don't, really don't want this to happen to me. And you may say the same thing, but we can turn it over to God. Back to 1 Peter 4. Peter also said that he who suffered in his body is done with sin. And, and I put a note in there. There's, I don't often like to throw a lot of the, the Greek words and all that. I think sometimes uh, people kind of get hung up with that. But when I think of, of this Greek word, it's not when, when we talk about being done with sin, it means to stop or to cease. If we have our, set, our, our mindset as the same as Jesus, one of the things that should come along with that is, you know what, I don't want to sin anymore. I want to stop. And I know that, that at least when we come to a church service like today, and I'm speaking from experience, I can remember being in services in my younger years and saying, Lord, I don't ever want to sin again. I want to live for you wholeheartedly. I, I want to just have a, a perfect life. I don't want to do anything wrong. But you know what happened? Probably didn't get out of the parking lot. And you know, what I'm, you know what I mean. It's easy to do that here. But having the attitude of Jesus, having his attitude, taking that with us, helps us to get away from sin. In Romans chapter 6, Paul said, For sin shall no longer be your master, because you are not under the law, but under grace. I am so thankful that God took away all of the laws. And in all of that, what he was doing is he, he didn't require us to, to memorize and to worry about all of the rules and the regulations. He said, I just want you to live for me. We are under grace. Now, granted, as human beings, we still need some kind of rules and regulations to go by. It's, I guess that's just the way that it is, as I even think of the church service today. Out here on the sign, what's it say? The second church service starts when? 11.15. We all show up then at the same time, right? If there was no time on there, if there was no rules that were going to start at 11.15, everybody would show up at their own time. Some would come at 8.15 because they're early risers. Some might not come till after lunch because they like to stay in bed a little longer. But when I think of, of what we have, there are rules... <clears throat> Excuse me. There are rules, but God has given us grace. God has also called us and wants us to live for His will. And in that verse, in 1 Peter, in verses 1 and 2, He tells us, as a result, they do not live, live the rest of their earthly lives for human evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. I mentioned this just a little bit earlier, but when I think about living for God's will, whether it's in the good times or the bad, we need to live for Him. And I want to say this, living for God is a choice. Living for His will is a choice for you. In Romans chapter 8, Paul wrote and said, Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. When we live for the Holy Spirit, when we live in wanting Him to direct our life every day, we find ourselves living for God. And let me say this. How many of you got up this morning, and in, if you took time to pray this morning, how many of you said to God, you know what? Everything that I do today, I want your spirit just to lead me. Whether it's where I want to go or whether it's not, I want your spirit to lead me. That's what Paul was talking about, being led by the spirit. When we open ourselves up, when we allow God to control our lives, when we allow the spirit 
to come in and guide us wherever we go, guess what's going to happen? We're going to live for him. We are going to live for him. We are going to see things happen. I'll just say this, thinking of Pastor Dave. There's a man who lives for the Spirit. And I have seen through the years, I've known Pastor Dave for a long time, and I have seen through the years of times when he felt the Holy Spirit was leading him in a certain direction and he followed, even when it wasn't the easiest, but followed. And thinking of all of that and living for him, 1 John 1, 6, if we say we have fellowship with him and we walk in darkness, we lie. I want you to think about your week. Because I mentioned earlier, it's easy to talk about some of these things or to feel a certain way when we're all gathered together here in church. But what about the week ahead? Or let's think about the week past. Were you living for Christ all through the week? Remember, today is Sunday. Tomorrow you're going to go back to work. You're going to go back to school. You're going to go to the grocery store. You're going to go wherever. And are you going to live for him? Are you going to seek his will in all things? I guess one way that I could relate all of this is that when I think of people coming to church, people like to impress the pastor. And, and <clears throat> I don't know if you've ever done this before or not, but when I think of coming to a church service, People often like to tell the pastor how much they pray and how much they read their Bible and all that. And, and with what John was saying in this last verse, it says, If we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie. You can fool me. You can fool Pastor Dave and how you're living and give one impression here. But if you don't walk that way all through the week, scriptures say we lie. And we're not lying just to a pastor but we're lying to God. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie. And so anyhow, Jesus is our example. First point. Next one is the past is our reminder. In verse 3 of 1 Peter 4, Peter wrote and he said, For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans chose or choose to do living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. Peter gave us a list, but I'm going to open it up today, and you can look at your own life, and I'm going to ask you to put your own words in there. What is your past? What list of words would you put in there if it were you? Because you may look at this list and say, you know what, I, I don't have a problem with some of these things. That doesn't describe me. And so I'm going to ask, what does? What does describe you? Most likely it would be different. But your past would paint a picture. I hope it would paint a picture that is different than what you're leaving, leading right, <clears throat> right now. Peter in this verse also, uh, if you go on to, to verse 4, talked about, uh, I'm sorry, now I lost, oh, I'm sorry. Verse 4, they think it's strange that you don't join them. I don't have the verse actually written out for you. But as, as I think about your old friends, if you've changed, what, have, what difference have your old friends seen in you? I know for myself, as I think of old classmates from high school when I was a teenager, when they find out that I'm a pastor today, often the reaction is, oh, really? What about your friends? First of all, do they know you're a Christian? Have they seen a change? And is there a change there for them to see? Sometimes we like to blend in. And, and I'll say for all of us, and I, I'm speaking to myself as much as anyone, when, when we 
get into a crowd or at least our old friends or, or people, we like to blend in, don't we? We don't want to stand out. And if you're in a crowd of people who do not know Christ, what's the first thing that we do? We like to be like them. And so our, maybe our language changes, maybe what we, what we say or what we do begins to change. I'm just simply going to ask, what do your friends see in you? What kind of change? In verse, verse 4, when Peter said, they, don't, they, didn't, they think it's strange that you don't join them. One of the things that came to my mind was people who struggle with drug addiction. You have someone who is addicted, and they end up getting out of that and, and getting help, and they get sober. And they start to celebrate being sober in, in the months and the years and as time goes on. But the, the real key to a lot of that is so many times someone that is under that ends up going back home and they're with their old friends again. And what happens? Sometimes they get sucked right back into it. But the friends that they had think it's really strange. It's weird that they aren't doing that any longer. You see, when you begin to come out from the old man, when, when Paul talked in, in Corinthians about becoming a new creation in Christ, we become a whole new person. And for those who don't know what that experience is all about, for those who have not experienced that, to them it's strange they think it's really weird that you're not doing those same things all over again. And so the past can be a reminder to us. If you look at your old life, is there a difference? Is there a difference at all? And can people see it? In verse 5, Peter said, But they will have to give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. They will have to give an account to him. I am so glad that I am not the judge. And when I think of, of how often we, we judge when we're not thinking about it. I'll put it that way. I hope you can relate to what I want to say to you. Because I've heard many times people say, I'm really glad I'm not the judge. And I am glad that I'm not the judge. Because for me, it becomes very difficult. I don't know someone's heart, but God does. And he will judge justly. He will judge justly. And so we don't have to worry about looking at the inside of someone. All right, let's move on. The future is our challenge. We have the past. We also have the future. In verse 7, of 1 Peter 4. Peter says, The end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. Be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. I talked earlier about waking up this morning and what kind of thoughts you had on your mind. How many of you, from the time you woke up this morning till the time that you came into the church service today, had something in your mind that you thought today was going to be the end of the world, the end of times, the rapture was going to come. Hmm. Nobody raised their hand, but as I think of, for us, how many of us picture any day as being the last day? Peter said, the end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and sober. First of all, be alert. In Mark chapter 13, Jesus said, Be on guard. Be alert. You do not know when that time will come. We don't know. And I'm not saying today that we, we can predict when that time will come. We can't. But are we prepared for that day? Are you living today as if it could be the last day? In 2 Peter chapter 3, he said, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. None of us know what time it will come. None of us know when our day will come. Maybe it will come very suddenly. In, in verse 11 of that same chapter, he said, Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people 
ought you to be? What kind of people ought you to be? If today we're going to be the last day, think about that for a minute. If for some reason we were, we were given an indication that today, at the end of today, the rapture was going to come. And the church would be lifted from this earth to leave forever. Would you live differently? Would you live any different than what you're doing right now? What would you do this afternoon after church is over? Would your desire be to go out and to tell others about how to go along with you? Would there be any of your friends, any of your family that you're not sure about and you would want to invite them to go along with you? Hmm. When it's the end of today, maybe we look a little bit different. Peter also calls us to be sober-minded, to be clear-minded. In Romans 12, 2, Paul said, do not, be, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I talked earlier about someone who, who struggles with an addiction. And, and when they come out of that, they continually to use the word sober. To be of sober or of clear mind. When something is no longer controlling your brain through a foreign substance, you now have a clear mind. Paul calls us to have that clear mind. But in doing so, he says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Transformed. It is something we need to strive to do all the time, allowing God to change us. At the beginning of the service, I talked about this Holy Spirit. Do, do you allow God to change the way that you think? Or are we stuck in the mindset, I'm right, I have my rights, this is the way I'm going to do it and I'm not going to change. Paul talks about being transformed by the renewing of your mind. For what reason? So that you can pray. If you are fighting God and the change that he wants to do in your life, you're sinning. Think about that a minute. We don't like to talk about sin. But if, you, if you're fighting God today, and as I look out over the congregation, I said this once before today, I don't know what all you guys are going through, especially as a guest speaker here today. I may have never met you before. I don't know what's going on in your life. But if you're fighting God today, you're sinning against him. It's time to give in and allow him to transform your life. David, in the Psalms, said, If I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. If I wanted my own way, our prayer life becomes much different. Jesus also tells us in Matthew 6 that when we pray, we're not to keep on babbling like the pagans, for they think they'll be heard because of their many words. I just want to encourage you today, as you think of your own prayer life, you don't have to say a lot of words. And there are and there were many who thought that just by praying a long prayer and having a lot of things to say that God was pleased with that. Think about this for just a minute. You're driving down the road and you're going somewhere. You come up to a traffic light and out ahead you can see that the light is red. As you get closer, right before you get there, it turns green. What do you do? How about a thank you, Lord? And you chuckle, but I want you to think of it in this way. What do you do when you respond in that way? Are you having conversation with God? Do you recognize where it came from? Simply saying, thank you. Did it have to be a long prayer? No. We can talk to God all day long in short segments. You know, when you think about relationships that you have with one another, there are times when we have a long conversation, but there's a lot of times, especially for husbands and wives, where maybe a few words is all that we need to say right now. But it's communication, and that's what God wants with us. 
And then in 1 Timothy 2.8, he says, Therefore I want the men everywhere to pray, lift, <clears throat> excuse me, lifting up holy hands without anger and disputing. Guys, I want to talk to you for just a moment. As I thought about this verse in 1 Timothy 2.8, Timothy wrote, Therefore I want the men everywhere to pray. And I think for some reason, guys seem to have a little more problem with this than the ladies. I don't know why. But I'm going to give you a challenge, guys. When's the last time that your friends or your family heard you pray? Out loud. Do your friends and family know where you stand with Jesus Christ? Because so many times we... Guys that will use the excuse that, you know, I'm not outward in my emotions and all of that. But I want to tell you something. Your family needs to know where you are with Jesus. And so where are you today? Now I'm going to include the ladies too and simply ask the question, where are you with Jesus? At the beginning of the message, I talked about all that he's done for us. He came to this earth and he gave of himself allowed his body to be beaten and bruised when he could have just stayed where he was at. He gave his own blood for us. We will celebrate that in a few weeks of all that he's done for us. Not only did he die on a cross, but he was victorious as they put him in a grave and thought they were done with him. They thought it was all over. But the stone was rolled away and he was victorious over sin and over death. And he's given you today that opportunity to say, yes, I believe that. Yes, I want to have my sins forgiven. And so you can do that right where you are. You don't have to walk down an aisle, but you can do that right where you are today. Well, let me close that in living the life, the reason for all of this, love is the reason in 1 Peter 4, 8, Peter said, Above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. Love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. How are we to love one another deeply? He gives us example in the next three verses. One is to offer hospitality. And he included in there without grumbling. I find that amazing that even back then people would have that problem. Did you ever hear somebody say, man, I had them over three times and they never invited me to their house. Pastor, I have this friend, but you know what? I'm always the one that has to make a phone call. Guess what? You're offering hospitality and then what are you doing? You're grumbling. Peter says, offer it without grumbling. Keep doing it over and over and over in verse 10, he says, use your gifts to serve others. When I look out over this congregation, I know that God has given you abilities and gifts, each and every one of you doing different things in different ways. One of the things that I mentioned earlier, some people like to get up early, some don't. I praise the Lord for those that like to get up really early on Sunday morning, because you know what? When I got here, there was already donuts and coffee ready in the fellowship hall. Not all of you are called to get up early, right? That's why you're here at 1115. But you have different gifts. God calls us to use those gifts for one another. And then in verse 11, speak the very words of God. I will just say this. When it comes to friends and family, people who do not know Jesus, we are called to speak the very words of God. There are times when, yes, we should speak. And also from that verse, because love covers a multitude of sins, Ephesians 4 says, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. And so we need to forgive one another. Love covers a multitude of sins. And I'll simply say this, that I often get that question too. 
How do I need to forgive? How many times do I have to forgive them? For most of you here today, you know the answer to that question. Peter asked Jesus, how many times do I need to forgive? What does he say? Seventy times seven. I know there's all kind of arguments of exactly what those numbers mean and, and what all that, you know, the exact amount of how many times we're going to do that. I'm just going to tell you, keep forgiving over and over and over, and pretty soon you'll get so good at it that you won't care how many numbers are in there. He says, just as in Christ, God forgave you. How many times has Jesus forgiven you personally? Then turn around and forgive someone the same amount of times. And then in closing, verse 11. So that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and power forever and ever. Live the life that God has called for you so that God in turn may be praised. Not you. Yes, people can appreciate what you've done. But in all that you do, God's name should be the one to be lifted up and to be praised. Let's do that this week. Let's take this week ahead. Say, I'm going to live for God this week. I am going to allow the Holy Spirit to guide my path. When people turn against me or people say things about me, you know, I told the, the, the folks at the first service, as soon as I got in the door this morning, people were already on my case about sleeping through the service. I tease and say that they hurt me. In fact, there's somebody at this service that said every time they see me, I'm eating. They were surprised to see me here today with nothing in my mouth. So I laugh. We tease about those things. But there are people who say hurtful things. Are we going to continue to push on to forgive? Let's encourage one another to live the life for Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for what you do for us, what you have done for us. And Lord, today I ask for your Holy Spirit just to be with those who are, are here as I think of this week ahead. As we strive to do for you, to live for you, to speak for you. That in the end, that you would be praised. Help us to use the gifts that you've given to us. Each of us are different Help us to use what you have, how you have made us, not someone else, but our own selves. And so thank you, Lord, for being our God. Thank you for dying on a cross that today can be a victorious time to live for you. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great week.